when you have a personal purpose or a purpose that is outside of yourself. So it should be, it should transcend yourself. It should reflect your personal values, what you met, what matters to you, what you love. That's one. Two is it has to be focused on other people um, without sacrificing yourself though. Those, those who maybe have a life-saving drug, or we still see this in the healthcare space, they're working so hard to improve the lives of others that often they sacrifice their own well-being. So transcend yourself, but value yourself in the process. Welcome to the HR LND podcast, where we explore cutting edge HR trends and best practices with top leaders who are shaping the future of work. My name is Nick Day, and I'm founder of JGA Recruitment Group, a specialist HR search firm. I'm also a qualified executive coach and a recognized HR thought leader listed on Thinkers360. Together, we're going to dive into topics from diversity and inclusion to technology, learning curation and employee experience to help you evolve your people and your development strategies. So whether you're a flourishing HR executive, a rising manager or a seasoned CHRO who's driving transformation, this podcast is for you. So grab your coffee and let's play. Hello and welcome back to the HR L&D podcast. My name is Nick Day, CEO at JGA Recruitment Group, and we're specialist HR recruiters. And today I'm joined by leadership thought leader and C-suite executive coach, Karen Kenny. Now, Karen has worked with a wide range of leaders from early stage start startup CEOs to Fortune 100 executives. She's also the founder of Evolve Leadership, which is a global executive coaching and development organization that offers the world's only holistic, and that's whole person, whole life, C-suite development program that prepares leaders to thrive in highly visible and demanding roles. Now, we know that more than ever, top leaders are starting to talk about their personal struggles. And that's a good thing because their roles are incredibly demanding. So whether that's you that's listening to this show, maybe you're a Fortune 100 CEO who's reflecting on some of the sacrifices and impacts that your work has had on your family, or maybe you're a high profile HR director that's calling out concerns about your, your own mental well-being. Well, the reality is you're not alone. Many, many senior leaders are struggling to cope. And I can tell you that firsthand because I myself am also an executive coach and I'm working with other leaders that are giving me the same challenges that Karen has been dealing with her entire career. Now, fortunately, her C-suite development programs have helped thousands of executives to achieve and sustain higher levels of physical well-being, mental and emotional resilience and I'm going to find out all about how she does that through her character-centered leadership programs during the course of this show. Now, you'll be interested to know as well, prior to her current um, role as CEO of Evolve Leadership, she spent 12 years at Johnson & Johnson, where Cam was part of the HR Performance Institute leadership team, and she was also executive director of its premier executive leadership program. So not only is she an excellent executive coach, but she's also come from a world immersed in the world of human resources. And she recently co-authored a book with uh, Dr. Jim Lower, international performance psychologist and human performance expert, which is a book titled Leading with Character, 10 Minutes a Day to a Brilliant Legacy. And there's a link to that book, which you'll find in the show notes. We'll find out more about that as well later in the show. So without further ado, my long introduction is over. Let me welcome Karen Kenny, C-suite executive super coach to the HR l &D podcast. Karen, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling great. Thank you, Nick. Great to be here with you. Fantastic to have you on the show. So let me start with uh, my first question, uh, which is this. What do the words human resources mean to you? It's a good question. Um, I, when, when I think of human resources and I think of a human resource leader, I, I feel like it really underrepresents what the role and is today. Um, I think back in the day, human resources was a source of support for individuals within an organization when they had troubles or challenges or managed kind of the tactical um, onboarding and things like that. I really feel that we need to rename the role and, and really think about what the purpose is for individuals in this role. I think the role of human resources is actually the number one role in an organization. Um, they have the most challenging, difficult, and important job. Um, I think it should be more human performance strategists or something along that line, because um, not only are they responsible for the success of individuals in the organization from the CEO um, cascading throughout the organization, but 
the challenges that they're facing today are greater than they've ever been before, things they've never seen. So um, when I think of it, I think it's it's it underrepresents the role and the job. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think the idea of it being called a you know, human performance level position is absolutely on point. And actually, no, I've given a, a quite a comprehensive introduction there to, to your background, but tell the audience a little bit more about you know, how you came to form Evolve Leadership, because your programs are different. And I know I've, I've gone through the coaching um, sort of courses myself to get to, to my level, but you have a multidimensional approach to coaching that really does maximize that human performance element that you just sort of um, mentioned there and you, you know, your, your thoughts about human resources. So tell us a little bit about your journey and what that multi-directional approach is and how you sort of, how it came to be. Yep, it's a good question. I, it actually started very personal for me. Uh, I became very interested in mental well-being, mental and physical well-being. Years ago, I was married to a great man who struggled with uh, increasingly debilitating mental illness. Um, he was a top leader in an organization, a dad, father of two daughters, um, struggled with this mental illness that ultimately you know, cost him his life through an inability to take care of himself physically, mentally, emotionally. Um, and there was just little resources available then to support people who were struggling. You might go see a therapist or a physician, you know, once a month for five minutes. So um, my first journey into this space was in a startup um, for creating the first digital health coaching programs for people with mental health and behavioral health challenges. Ultimately, we got acquired into Johnson & Johnson as part of its launch into health and wellness. And um, I was part of that leadership team that helped to launch that and then um, moved directly into the Human Performance Institute, which J&J also acquired, um, really focused on creating the healthiest workforce in the world. That was their number one and then offering these programs externally. Um, Back uh, about a little over two years ago, J and J closed the commercial part of that business, so it was just serving its internal employees. And that's when I started Evolve Leadership with many of the same coaches, with the two co-founders of the Human Performance Institute, so we could continue to provide this training externally. But it was kind of a combination of understanding the impact of mental health and well-being on on performance for leaders and actually entire organizations for all of us. Fantastic. And actually, although we, we hear a lot of this, you know, mental health now is much more in the public domain than it used to be. More people are talking about it, but still nowhere near enough people. There's still a stigma, you know, attached to mental health. We're still, you know, lots of people still afraid to, to come forward. I guess before we, I want to find out what you think we can do about that. But also, I'd love to know a little bit more about the impact that that Human Performance Institute had when you were at J&J. It's kind of led you to evolve leadership, we know, but you had a uh, must have had a profound impact to create, as you said, the, the world's healthiest or mental, certainly from a mental perspective, workforce in the world. Well, personally, for me, it had great impact. I think um, we're often training people in skills and competencies for roles. And while that's important, we're missing this whole person option. And there was a, a, a science-based formula that doctors Jim Lair and Jack Roppel worked on for years, originally starting with athletes. Um, training some of the top athletes in the world. And you think of top tennis players, yet they never picked up a racket or a piece of equipment, but training them in the mental game and the emotional yeah. game and the physical. So how do you prepare yourselves? We are, as human beings, we have these interconnected dimensions of who we are and well-being and performance is inextricably linked. And if you don't focus on who you are, all aspects of that, you're not going to perform long-term. You might make it into a role, especially a top role, but you won't be able to sustain it. But foundation to all of that is personal purpose. So all of our training, whether it's one-on-one -on -one coaching or team-on-one -on coaching or workshops and everything out of the Human Performance Institute originated with purpose, and that was personal purpose. And so now it's becoming more of a mainstream idea, which is great. But if you don't get your why correct and then build you know, capacity around that, build your your life, your work, your, you know, everything that the way you engage with others, um, you're not going to be able to, su to uh, sustain it. So we really went beyond business competencies and skills to look at what makes a human being tick, what are their challenges, what are their barriers, where do they need to um, identify and address vulnerability, and that is physical, it is mental, it is emotional to yeah. all those areas. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I love the fact you mentioned uh, the tennis thing, only because one of my favorite books, and I know it's a little bit old school now in some of the language used, but uh, Tim Galloway's In a Game of Tennis. 
which really talks about the psychology of tennis, which is, uh, as you say, it, it's not just about the ability to, to swing a racket. It's the inner game we play inside our heads and that inner voice. And it can be challenging and, and never more challenging, arguably, now for CEOs in this new world of work. It's complex. It's unpredictable. So in your experience of working with CEOs, what will it take for the next wave of CEOs coming through to be able to navigate what is a very challenging and unpredictable environment? I think the key thing is they have to be more agile. They have to be willing to take risks. There's no playbook. Um, there's yeah. just, we don't know what's going to come. We didn't know the pandemic was going to come. We didn't We didn't know that anything was going to come. So I think at the end of the day, you have to, you can't prepare for everything. You don't know what's going to come, but you can prepare for anything. So one is, you know, in this new expanded set of skills, you want to be comfortable with change and uncertainty. You have to be able to pivot and take risks. If you are not... Um, you know, feeling in control, if you're feeling stressed or overwhelmed or fearful, you're not going to take those risks. You're not going to pivot. You're, um, but if you feel like you're, you can prepare for anything that happens and you have a plan in place on how to activate, then then you're going to be able to do it. So certainly that comfort with change and uncertainty, it's, it's critical. Um, and then the ability to influence and inspire because you, you, now have to engage employees, shareholders, consumers in a very, very different way. Your purpose and value, the mission of your company is more important than actually the product that you're offering. Because if you want your employees to stay, to be motivated, if you want consumers to buy your product or your services, you have to be able to inspire them. Um, This whole quiet quitting, great resignation, um, you know, Leaders and companies have lost control, so they have to operate differently at the top. Um, this human connection, empathy, those types of values are really important for CEOs. They can't sit back in a room and just operate and you know, run and manage operations. They have to. They're being scrutinized. So people have to believe in them as individuals and their purpose and their values. They have to be critical, credible and character driven. And then in terms of how they're engaging with you know, all of their stakeholders. And then I think another key area, as we talked about, is they have to invest and train differently, invest in themselves holistically in these four dimensions. So you have to expand your training beyond, you know, the skills to do the job. And this idea, you know, we just talked about tennis of recovery is critical for everyone. Yeah. But, but you know, we, you talk about how challenging it is at the top of the organization. We need to recover and oscillate in a different way. It's not about that weekend or that vacation. In tennis, Jim Lair was, you know, one of the fa- things he was famous for was teaching tennis players that 16 second reset in between plays. You have to reset yourself mentally, emotionally, physically to prepare for the next shot, you know, forget what just happened bring down your heart rate, all those types of things. As leaders, we need to be able to quickly recover in all those dimensions because you're just constantly getting hit with the next thing. And you can't afford to make one mistake, say one thing that's going to be negative or work against you because the entire world is watching you. Something that's really that resonates with what you mentioned about recovery, massive believe in recovery. And and for those that know me, I'm a big sports nut anyway. But I always think if you think about the Formula One, the, the races are one in the pits and that's the one time the car gets to recover. And we have this, we're running the fastest cars in the world in the Formula One Grand Prix, but actually you get that pit stop wrong or you don't take a pit stop, the car doesn't make it to the end of the race. And it's the I same in the that. world of work, right? So I couldn't agree more on the recovery side. One thing that hit me though, when you gave that response, and um, I know that your approach is very holistic in the way that you do things. And we're talking about the new wave of leaders need to be inspirational. They need to be empathetic. There needs to be lots of them. We're layering, they're layering and layering a level of pressure there. There might be a CEO listening to this or an HR leader that's going, well, I need to be inspirational. I need to be empathetic. But it's a bit like if I say to a comedian, be funny, suddenly they can't be funny. It's really difficult. So where do we start that? We know we want to be inspirational. We know we need to be inspirational. We know we want to be empathetic. We need to be empathetic. But how do we, without taking that on as an additional kind of pressure that weighs us down, knowing we need to be these things, where do we start that journey? How do we start to navigate some of that? I think to me, it's it's very simple and it is connecting with your personal purpose. So I'm listening to you right now. You're very energized. You clearly love your work. You're passionate about it. You know your work, but you're doing something I believe that you love. Are you doing this for the money or are you doing this? Oh, no, it's, it's not for profit. So it's definitely for what I love. I love learning and I love meeting inspirational people like yourself that that change my perspective and make me think. And listening to your responses is getting my brain and my neurons firing. And yeah, it's, uh, it's oh, I love it. It's definitely a passion thing for me. 
So you're inspirational. You're inspirational to me. You're inspirational to your listeners. And in the same way, if you think about a CEO, and again, if you think about in the past, you often people are training for achievement. This happened in sports, right? They would try to get to the top of their game. They'd try to be number one. By the way, once you get to be number one, you still have to continue to train to maintain that position. Um, in the world of business, you train, and if their their goal is to become CEO, then they've hit that goal, but then oftentimes they feel lonely and lost and unfulfilled because their end game was achievement. I want to get yeah. this role or this amount of money. So you, their why versus think of a, a leader who says, I want to do this because I want to have an impact on others. First of all, I want to be a, a great dad, influence my kids, show them that they can achieve anything they want as long as it's something that has meaning to them. I want to influence my employees and my leadership team. I want them to feel that I made a difference as their leader. I want to impact our, our customers or our clients and make a difference in their lives. When you have a personal purpose or a purpose that is outside of yourself. So it should be, it should transcend yourself. It should reflect your personal values, what you met, what matters to you, what you love. That's one. Two is it has to be focused on other people um, without sacrificing yourself though. Those, those who maybe have a life-saving drug, or we still see this in the healthcare space, they're working so hard to improve the lives of others that often they sacrifice their own well-being. So transcend yourself, but value yourself in the process. Yes, you can have great public speaking skills or not, or presentation skills. There's training for that. But the truly the way to inspire is if you believe in what you're doing, if what you're doing is to impact others. So you will be inspirational when you have that passion. It, sh it shows through. It impacts others. There isn't one way to do it. You can be quiet and a little more introverted, but you can still inspire because you believe in something and because you care about your teams and you're all working together. Does that make sense? I couldn't think of a better response. You've absolutely, I mean, that's fantastic. I just, what, what I'm landing with me is the, the, the a, a goal or a mission that transcends yourself. And I, I didn't know you were going to go there, but the first three examples I did know when I wrote down, which was all about other people, whether it's a parent or the team you're taking, I and mean, all customer success. And it was really interesting. I was listening, go, God, all these goals you're, you're mentioning to me now, they're not actually, they're not specifically for that individual. And then, of course, you continue with your response to say, because they all transcend yourself, which is fantastic. So staying on that point for a moment, loads of companies now, most companies now, are really passionate about developing their own mission statements, their values, their behaviors. They want everyone to buy in. And we know that they, you know, have a massive impact on the way that they create their company cultures on the back of that, providing they live those and people people believe in them and, and follow them. However, you we've talked a lot of bit today about finding your own why and, and, and your purpose that hopefully will transcend yourselves. Do you find that people spend enough time then working on their own mission statements? CEOs are very good at finding mission st statements for their business, but are they neglecting themselves in that equation? Yes. The answer is they're not spending enough time. You're right. A company purpose is, is important. It's really critical now and it's stakeholders expect it, but they're neglecting the ability to focus on, not the ability, they're, they're neglecting to spend time on the personal purpose. And that is what is so critical because um, we poll people. So when we do training, whether it's um, we do personal assessments or we do company assessments. But one of the things we look into is can they articulate a personal purpose? And I would say between 60 and 65% say no, another 10% wow. say, I don't know. So the answer is people do not, or they think that company purpose is their purpose. Well, what happens when you change roles or change companies or retire, all of a sudden your purpose goes away and that's what you've been fighting for. So what I tell people is, you want to work for a company with purpose. That's important. And then you have to have a personal purpose. That company purpose and personal purpose should align. It doesn't mean you can necessarily live out your personal purpose in your company, but if it compromises it, you should think about something different. We're seeing the Del Deloitte survey, 70% of uh, C-suite executives contemplating leaving their jobs because they feel it's not worth it. If they could find purpose in their work, enact their personal purpose. So for me, my personal purpose is very per personal to my two daughters. We're older now, but I still, you know, I want to have a big influence on their lives. I wanted to teach them they could overcome and achieve anything. I wanted to create independence for them. Well, I could do that in my interactions with them and not doing everything for them in my role and in my job. 
I'm still activating on my purpose because I'm showing them I can actually lead a company if I want, but I want to still have an impact and I want them to have the benefit out of it. So the idea is you need to have both. You should work for, if as a leader, you should be able to, you know, establish for your company, articulate and align everyone around a purpose and a mission. But you that you and every single person in that organization should spend time on their personal purpose and just simple questions they can ask themselves, you know, why am I here? What must I accomplish to live a life of true success? What's the legacy I want to leave? And if you don't spend time on that, and again, we can all do it just through journaling, spending time. If you don't get to that, you're going to you're going to be at a loss in your life. And the other thing I would really encourage people to do is make sure you have metrics around it. Cuz so many people that tell me they do have a purpose and then say I want to influence women around the world to be better or I want to you know change the lives of people you know who are struggling with this or that. Um it's too broad. So you want to yeah. be a little more specific so that at the end of the day, at the end of the year, at the end of your life you can say, "Yep, I I did that or I made progress." Or at the end of the day you say, "You know what? I fell short. I was impatient here. I did this here. So I'm going to course correct tomorrow." But having that purpose is like your north star so that you can check yourself all along the way. And and that's, you know, it's it's not soft. There's so much research that shows it's associated with you know, immune, immunological function, um, health and well-being, mental yeah. well-being, longevity. It's all, there's so much research out there. So it's critical, critical. Well, I think hopefully, and I'm going to make a sweeping generalization here, but because most of our listeners are HR leaders and professionals, they're usually pretty good at measuring impact. So that's a good thing. However, I guess the question I have for you, because specifically, Karen, you've worked with some of the you know, world's top CEOs, which is a, you know, a, a, a fantastic and privileged position. And it shows hopefully the level of expertise that you're operating at. If I'm an HR leader listening to this, I'm not saying for a second, it's not about them taking care of their own purpose as well. And so, so please don't think I'm ignoring that when I, when I ask you this question. But if I'm an HR leader or an HR director, and I recognize that potentially my own CEO's mental health perhaps has deteriorated, or perhaps I suspect there's something not quite right. Why should that, within my own HR agenda and all the things I've been managing, why should that, or should it even, but I'm going to ask the question why, why should that be a top priority for a board? We know the, we, the influence CEOs have, but if we don't do something about it, what could be the impact? So what's the impact that you've seen in the world when it hasn't been addressed? Uh, the the impact is huge. I just want to make one comment on the HR leader where you say, if sure. I see, sorry, I see that. I, I'm not, I don't want to generalize, but I see this a lot in HR leaders that we work with is oftentimes it's the same as the healthcare space. H, oftentimes people who go into that field are doing it because they truly care about helping other people. Um, they're very, very good at caring and helping, but oftentimes they tend to sacrifice themselves for their organizations or Great point. they'll say, I don't have time because I'm trying to, our company's going through this or that. They get the brunt of a company going through crisis. Certainly, all of the leaders do, but everyone turns to HR. So their investment in their own well-being is more important than ever. I do see a lot of sacrificing with that. But in terms of it being a board priority for the HR leader, for the board, absolutely, because like we just talked about, health and well-being is inextricably linked because 40% of CEOs don't last in their role 18 months. That's a- Is that how high it is? That is high and that's concerning. And actually, you know, Usually ethical, not usually, more recently, ethical reasons have been the number one reason for those dismissals. And typically, someone doesn't go into a role thinking, I'm going to be unethical. Unethical. Uh, What happens is you're stressed, you're overwhelmed, you're fearful, you're anxious, you're feeling imposter syndrome, whatever those things coming at you um, cause you to maybe make decisions you wouldn't have made if you were more confident, if you had you know, more investment in your well-being, if you're more rested, if you have more energy, if you're more resilient. So those are critical. I mentioned the Deloitte survey, about 70% of C-suite executives considering leaving. That's why it should absolutely be a priority because the cost to a company is just not what could be billions in, in you know, shareholder value. It's yeah. the impact on your leadership team, on mor- morale, your culture. Um, so it's critical that that it's a board priority, that's an HR priority. That said, um, the HR leader can do the best they can, kind of lead them, influence them to 
focus on themselves and get training. But what I found with clients is the ones who are most apt to be successful are those who see the need, you know, if you can convince that if, if you try to, if a board tries to, you know, fix a CEO, we're going to put him or her through coaching, right? It's, um, it, it makes them maybe a little bit more, you know, pulling back, they don't trust in me. So ideally your leaders see the value in your, your, the role of the HR can be showing them the ability for, you know, greater potential and influence versus trying to, you know, fix them, if you will. Have you ever asked yourself, how can any recruiter understand my HR recruitment challenges? Please don't give up on your hiring challenges just yet. Here at JGA HR Recruitment, we appreciate the difficulties associated with attracting, recruiting and retaining top human resources talent. We also understand just how costly a poor hire can be. JGA HR Recruitment would like to partner with you to help you overcome your hiring challenges. Contact us today on 01727 800 377 or visit jgarecruitment.com to find out more. If you're an HR professional at the moment, I, and I, I use this as a visual just because I think it works for the world of HR. And, you, and my daughter today has just flown to Spain to do a little exchange, so it's kind of relevant in my head. But if, if a plane starts to go down and they, then they get in the mask drop, HR professionals probably have a tendency to go, they'll be the first thing, they'll put it on everyone else. But actually, they always say, put the own mask on yourself first, then you can help others. And I do think you're absolutely right. HR is one profession where actually the first instinct is to help everyone else before they help themselves. But eventually that's going to manifest itself. It's going to cause a problem. Um, so I think you, you made a great point. So thank you for, for raising that before jumping into the, the CEO question, because I think it's a really relevant and, and pertinent point where the HR first do listen to this. Actually, if your first response in your mind was actually I'd put help everyone else put their mask on before I do my own, then maybe there's something there that you need to explore um, because that may be a, an imbalance somewhere potentially. But what I'd love to know from yourself, Karen, is um, what are some of the lessons then that you've learned on your journey with, with you with these, with these senior leaders? Particularly, you know, how do they differ from startup environments because you've worked in both to major corporations? Are, are they similar challenges? Do they differ? And what, are there any key lessons that our listeners can take away today? Yeah, I, I found they're very similar. Honestly, they they struggle with the same things. Um, confidence is a big one. Um, imposter syndrome. If it, I actually say if you don't struggle with imposter syndrome at some point, you're not in the right role. You're not pushing yourself hard enough, or you're not developing because it's inherent in any time that you do something new or different, or you're and pushing out of your comfort zone. It's what you do with it that's important, right? There's training around that, but um, they all struggle with confidence and imposter syndrome at some point. And as, as the world, you know, you've seen what we've experienced, something else is going to happen next. That we didn't anticipate the pandemic. We can't anticipate what's going to happen next. So it is that, you know, ability to be prepared, but burnout is consistent. In a startup, you're killing yourself, you know, because you're wearing many hats and, um, you know, different stakeholders, investors, but at the same time, you know, a fortune 100 CEO has the same challenges, the challenges of the board. You're very, very much in the public eye. So some of the differences are startups, you're less, you know, you don't have that visibility of, you know, kind of social media impact and, and challenges, but, um, but those inner challenges are, are the same. They, all have personal lives um, that we often don't think about. We can be very critical about a CEO and role. Well, they make a lot of money. Well, they all have personal lives. They might have children who are struggling with, you know, substance abuse or mental health issues. They may be struggling themselves. Um, again, in the larger company, you there is more visibility. So people are watching you at a greater rate. Um, the impact is, is bigger on a company. But from a personal standpoint, it can be a lonely role. Um, because you're moving into something that you haven't done before and it's uncomfortable, it's lonely, um, there's risk, there's pressure. So I'd say there are more similarities and there are differences other yeah. than the things I pointed out. Something that um, just hit me when you mentioned that about the imposter thing, and that, this is me thinking, and I'll bring it back to sports in context. So I went out to uh, the Ironman World Championships this year and for the first time it hit me really hard with imposter syndrome. I was there on the start line looking around and everyone just looked fitter and healthier than I did. And I was like, my wife was like, you deserve to be here, Nick. But I was like, well, I don't know. Look at these athletes. These these guys are incredible. 
so I, I, that hit me really hard with imposter syndrome there. But what, what the reason I mentioned that and the reason I relate it is actually the more successful we become and the more people become CEOs, of course, you're more exposed then to other senior leaders and you look across the table and you realize, or you makes you feel like everyone else here is successful because they've done what they've done. And they, and outwardly, they, all those things look amazing, which then makes us question whether we should be in that room. But you may find that most people are, I imagine would be therefore thinking the same. And I wonder now if the athletes, when I turned up in St. George, were looking at me going, look at him, how do I, and you just don't know, do you? So that imposter syndrome is really interesting and it can be really lonely at the top because your peer group gets smaller and you work, you've obviously elevated your way up and that you've got no one really to talk about it. So is this something that you see really prevalent then at that level? It's incredibly prevalent. And you're right. The peer group, the people that you, it doesn't matter if you're a CEO, even if you're a CHRO, if you're at the a, a top level, like you said, the people that were your friends and that maybe you talked about other people, you shared your insecurities with all of a sudden, you can't share that. You, you need to exude confidence and you need to exude confidence all the time because if you feel uncertain, that causes a ripple effect. So it's incredibly prevalent. You're right. Other people in the room may, may have thought the same thing about you. One thing that's hurt us terribly is social media. If you look at yeah. LinkedIn and Instagram and we all, everyone has a perfect life. They're exceedingly successful in their role. They're thriving. That's, that's the story they create. That's not their lives. Their life is messy. None of that is, in, you know, comes out. So part of it is what we do to each other around that. We, we convey or, you know, our communications teams or PR teams convey this, you know, perfect life, perfect role, perfect person that doesn't exist in this room. So, you know, the way you approach that is you, you kind of learn to coach yourself around it, to ask yourself questions while well, I'm in the room. How did I get here? I got here for a reason, right? Um, what makes, what evidence do I have that I'm not, you know, as good as others. And by the way, don't I probably bring something unique and that I am a unique human being and everyone else is in the room. Um, the first thing, most important thing is what you did. You acknowledged it, you said it to, you know, your wife, like I, I wondered if I was in the room. So one is just acknowledge the feelings like this is human life. This is the world. So acknowledge it. And then you start to, to ask yourself some challenging questions, like what evidence do I have to, for this to be true? You know, when is this, when have I felt this before and how do I dress with it? And reminding yourself that, oh, I'm feeling this because this is a little out of my comfort zone. And by the way, if we don't experience stress, intentionally experience stress, like seek it out in these roles or positions, then we're going to atrophy it, all of our, you yeah. know, your muscles atrophy. If you don't continue to work out in the same way, mentally, emotionally, we atrophy as human beings. If we start to, you know, go take the easy route or not push ourselves. So you're actually growing and it's helping your neuro pathways, all those things. It's so good for you, even though it's so uncomfortable. The key is you don't want to stay there. You want to have strategies to coach yourself back. You need that recovery and oscillation. Okay, I'm going hard. Now I need a break. I need recovery, reset. I need to meditate. I need to think about my negative thoughts or challenging thoughts. I need to rewrite this story that isn't serving me, things like that. So it is about really creating this whole human system of how do we prepare? How do we lead? How do we respond and react when we have those uncomfortable moments? Yeah, I mean, great points. So I could talk to you about this all day. I want to try and keep it so I don't, you know, I'm conscious of time as well. But if we talk about that stress thing. I, I want to hold on to that for a moment because we often associate stress as always being a bad thing. It gets a lot of negative press. And of course, it should when it when stress becomes distressful. But there is, for those familiar, and you, you mentioned neurological pathways, you mentioned stress there. And actually, a lot of people thrive at a certain level of stress. And there is a, there's a curve for those that want to Google this, you can. I'm not a scientific expert in this field, but there's something called eustress, which is the upward curve where stress can be really, really positive. It only becomes negative when we take on too much and it becomes distressful. But actually many people, particularly top performers, uh, which obviously you, you're working with daily, Karen, actually thrive in that part just before the apex in that eustress moment. Something I wanted to ask you, though, we've talked a little bit about loneliness. We've talked a little bit about imposter syndrome, which is clearly very prevalent at the senior end of the scale. We briefly touched upon this. I just want to ask you if you've got any practical steps or any advice for those suffering from those that have become CHROs. They've, they've strived their entire career to become a CEO, a CHRO. They get there. 
and they feel empty. It isn't what they thought it was. They think they've come to the end of their journey. You mentioned it a little bit earlier. I, I previously seems to be the guest called Alan Stein Jr., who has written a book called Sustain Your Game, which I thought was really interesting. But that was that was um, more related to sports uh, professionals. But in the world of executive leadership, what can they do to to sustain that feeling of of or that journey? And I know you talked about it a little bit with terms of being outward focused. What was the first kind of practical step you'd give to someone who maybe just become a CHRO and just feels a little bit empty inside? It wasn't what they thought it was going to be. Yeah, it's a good question, and it is often the case, and that's it's very um, depressing to to get to that place, right? To think I worked so hard. And and typically when you feel that way too, you think of all the sacrifices you made. Mm -hmm. I spent less time with family, with friends. I worked all these hours and now I'm here. This is the brass ring. This is the trophy. And, and it's not what I thought it would be. So, so the good thing is that you recognize that because if you are just achievement oriented, and if you don't have an external purpose, then you're just going to go you know, step over dead bodies, you're going to do whatever you can to continue to thrive and do well. So it to me, it's a sign of of a good person who recognizes that, you know, this isn't what I wanted. There, There is something more. And the great thing that we have every day when we get out of bed is the ability to reflect and and change. And so if they get to that point, that's where an exploration on purpose is, is so important. We should be doing this throughout our whole life because your purpose evolves too and changes as your life circumstances change. I work with retirees now to C-suite executives who are retiring and they're, they're, everything is gone, their purpose, everything. And yeah. while they, they were going to be excited, they're either feeling incredibly lost and lonely, or they're saying yes to everything and realizing that wasn't the right thing to do. Like they should be more thoughtful and approach it strategically in the same way that they approach their their career. But anyway, um, I, my advice to them when they get to that point is to stop and reflect and journaling can be incredibly powerful here and think about what's important to me. Um, there's an exercise around best self. You know, when am I at my best? When am I thriving? What am I doing? Where am I? What are, words describe me? And then What's the delta between where I am right now? So if there's that delta, it's let me start thinking about now what matters to me. What's the impact I want to have? So those questions before, like, why am I here? What must I achieve to be successful in this life and have a meaningful life? What legacy do I want to leave? What impact do I want others to have? How do I want to be remembered at my funeral? Writing some of that down and coming to that purpose and then saying, is this job right now where I am enabling me to do that? Um, if it is, well, it's it's not, obviously, because you said they're struggling. So if it's not, is there something I could do differently? Can I change my role? Can I do something differently to impact it? So there's some questions to be asked around that. And if the answer is no, and it's it's actually prohibiting them from, from living the life that they want to live and, and having that meaning, then that's the hard decision of, I think I need to transition out and do something that means more. And a lot of times people have this fear of, Will I find something else or why, well, you know what, you got to that role, you got to that position. Yeah. Yes, you'll find something else, but make sure it's something that gets you excited to get out of bed every day, because this could be the last day, week, month of your life. And, and you don't want to have those regrets. So we all have them. We all feel guilty. We all have these emotions sometimes, but, but it's what we do with it. And the great thing is we have an opportunity to start something new every day. Yeah, and you can start now. That's the thing, isn't it? Right? Is it's start with Absolutely. your why, start with your purpose. Don't don't, don't procrastinate. Absolutely. Yeah, but that's know. foundational. The purpose is foundational. It's so critical. For sure. So, from your perspective, Cal, what what's the future then for C-suite executive teams and, and and leadership in particular? I think the future is just changing the way we view leadership. Um, it, it's really expanding in a you know investing in an expanded set of skills. It is. Um, you know, leading from the heart, leading with purpose, um, building companies with purpose. Um, but it is it is a different approach. You can't just come out and manage and and dictate to everyone else. You have to inspire, but it begins with with starting with yourself. So I think I think we see more leaders investing in that and recognizing it. And certainly the pandemic, the challenges over the past few few years um highlighted that for us. They have to be comfortable working in different environments, hybrid environments. Um, but it, we we have a big light shining right now on mental well-being and burnout. It is impacting at every letter, level of the organization, you know, from the CEO down to the shop floor. And if we don't start focusing on that and, and 
investing in the well-being of individuals, we're we're all going to be in trouble. So I think leadership has to change in that way. Yes, you can still go to these great schools and um, invest in in the training, et cetera. But that's just one very small part of yeah. the equation. Yeah, I love that. So I, I, just just while you mentioned it, the pandemic, and I know it's still having an impact on the reality. What were some of the things that you learned? Are there any sort of secrets that you discovered during that that period that just, I guess, came out of the woodwork, so to speak, when it comes to to leading agile teams or building just resilient teams? Because we had to build a lot of resiliency around what the pandemic threw at us, right? So what, what kind of things did you discover in your own work that perhaps might be useful for the listeners to to hear? Yeah, I was um I was with J and J at during the time of the um during the pandemic. And and one of the things um, I was charged with and volunteered for was helping develop programs and training for people um, now working in a hybrid environment and really support resources for people. I think the biggest learning for me is, yes, we can work in a hybrid environment or a remote environment, um, but we've lost a human connection in that. Human connection is the most important thing for building relationships. And it is about that you know, we learn more about people and connect with them more, not in the meeting, but in the interactions and social interactions and just checking in, you know, seeing them in the hall type thing. Um, so one thing, I think the biggest thing the pandemic taught me is this need for a greater human connection. Um, people were already struggling. Burnout was there. It's just the pandemic exacerbated that. Um, and, and, and it also led people to wonder if it was worth it. So I don't, I'm not a fan of, do we go all remote or all in office? I do think hybrid can work. Um, I think remote can work for some organizations, but it's important for leaders to really focus on that human connection piece. Um, what is most effective is when people at the top or higher levels of an organization can show vulnerability. When our leaders said, you know what, this is hard for me, I'm struggling, um, people felt permission and okay to actually talk about their own challenges and actually felt okay about it. When you talk about imposter syndrome or confidence, knowing that I'm not alone in my feelings is important. So for leaders, one of the biggest learning is show your vulnerability, show that you're human to share your stories. And that gives other people permission to and encouragement to share their stories. The other is, like I said, I do think some in-person or connections, even if it's four times a year is really important. As companies are designing, and I know with HR leaders, they're often, um, at least the ones we work, waiting to see what are what other people are doing. You don't want to be the first one to bring people back in a certain way, or you don't want to be the first one to do something else. Um, but I think the key there is be strategic about why and intentional really about why you're bringing people together and when they're together. If you just say, we're going to be in office Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but they're you're not, not planning your important meetings then, um, or you're offering them donuts and bagels and all these things, free lunch to come (laughs) into the office, free beer. That's not it. Don't make it about, we're going to create meaningful connections for people. We're going to be strategic when we bring them together. We'll do our brainstorming sessions. We will maybe build in some social, you know, events, but not to bribe them with food, more to get them to know each other personally and to build those relationships. So I think those were the biggest learning for me. Yeah, some great learning. I'm really glad I asked the question and thank you for sharing. So you, you, you mentioned this statistic I don't want to lose before um, we close the show today, which was the, it surprised me, which I didn't know, which is, I think you said 18 months is the average tenure for a CEO. And I, I found that quite shocking. But I also read something prior to this show, which I wanted to bring up today, which, which I also found interesting, which you said that women CEOs are 45% more likely to be fired. And that was another shocking statistic. I wonder if you can tell me more about that, why that, why that is, and and yeah, that 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 hit me between the eyes when I read that. I couldn't believe that that to be true. Yeah, it is, and it it's certainly disappointing. And, and I don't know. I'm sure you see this too, but we're seeing more and more women stepping back out of roles now too. We're losing a little bit um, of the gain we've had on on yeah. women in the C-suite. So what companies tend to do, especially as we went through the whole Me Too, you know. Um, period, which obviously still happens, but but at least light was shined on that. Or when there's a crisis or um, an ethical, poor ethical decision by a CEO that causes quick removal, companies tend to put women in um, to those roles. One is it looks better, right? Um, but it but women tend to be good at fixing things and um, 
and figuring things out are very strategic. They know there's there's value in putting women in a role. So often they'll, they'll put woman, a woman in a role to fix things or when companies in crisis. Also, there may be women who are striving to get into a CEO role, but when a company is not doing well, say financially, it might uh, it, it's easier perhaps for a woman to get into that role. Maybe maybe a CEO that's been successful for a while might not be as attracted to their role. There's multiple reasons why a woman might be put into the role, or where there are these quotas set for we want this many women on you know on a leadership teams on boards. So oftentimes, um, women or a person of color they, they will kind of leapfrog them into these roles. Um, without preparing them and training them. So, cause they're trying to check a box, which is really irresponsible yeah. on the part of, of boards and, and leadership teams and HR leaders. So a couple of things are in the first instance where they're putting women in roles and then, then the reason there isn't often sustainability or they're fired is board members and investors. They've seen a lot of bias towards women that they think that, okay, we're going to put them in, but they don't feel that they can sustain. So the sad statistic is when companies are performing women well, the rate of dismissals for females and males are the same. But when um, I'm sorry, when a company is doing poorly, but when a company is doing well, they're more likely to dismiss female leaders because there's not that confidence that the, the leader can sustain performance over time. So it's really biased. So the thing we can do there is start training boards, investors, others, because investors is another piece on on, on that bias, educate them about that within themselves because they tend to scrutinize women much more. They're you know on top of them much more. So that's one. And then in terms of the the second part, whereas we're not preparing them and they're saying, is this worth it? Is we need to train. We need to train and prepare yeah. women for these roles. You don't prepare someone going into war um, when they're on the battlefield, right? You prepare them and, and get them ready for the role. And so by training and preparing them earlier instead of all of a sudden saying, oh, we need to find someone to put in the role. We need to diversify this team. It's not responsible on the part of the company. And then it discourages women from going into the role saying, is this worth it? I'm getting more scrutiny and they're seeing it happen with other women. Um, I don't need this, right? Um, so we need to do a better job training from an HR perspective, we need to do a better job in, in training investors, you know, stakeholders, boards on bias. And, you know, it's, it's to me, a responsibility they need to take pretty seriously if we want to be successful and have great diverse teams and, and women leaders as part of that. For sure. As you, I mean, you mentioned, they, you know, failures prepare us, prepare to fail, but, you know, we're recording this just before International Women's Day. It's probably going to be published just after International Women's Day, but um, a statistic there that I think I wanted I wanted to highlight because we need to do something about that, right? And if that's about training and investment and and changing perceptions of this podcast and have a small um, impact on that, then we need people to listen to this and to get that message through. Because you mentioned people on boards. I'm, I'm making the assumption here that a lot of that are going to be men on boards that need to change their thinking and they need the training. It's not always about the, the female CEOs that need the training. It's the boards that are making the decisions behind that that need to be educated on 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 the ramifications of those decisions, which which just make no sense to me. So I, I had to ask that question. Um, well, and it's that bias training. So if we think about it, for when sure. people have these inherent biases, they don't know that. They don't think it about themselves. I'm going to be biased. We do. We all have it in life. We all form. Yeah judgment opinion about other people and it often comes from bias and so often companies will do this um bias training you know in their organizations and crucial conversations and all those types of things but it's like we need we need that training at the top level of the organization to understand that maybe they have a bit of bias that can be negatively impacting impacting their decisions or how they engage with evaluate leaders, including women yeah. leaders. Yeah. Well, as you said earlier, if you, if you get it right at the top, it filters down. Whether that's vulnerability or whether that's training, right? It, if we start at the top, it will filter down. So that's the starting point. That's, that's what all this is about, right? Because the behavior of our leaders, whether it's investing in their well-being or connecting to purpose or talking about their vulnerability or making that human connection interacting differently is going to happen in the organization yeah. for hr if they implement a, a program or a campaign whatever they do and it's not happening at the top of the organization even if it's we're going to take no no email friday afternoons but the leaders are doing it or take your vacations and we're not doing it or you know it's not going to happen so the reason you know focusing at the top of the organization is so important is we know the impact is going to be much greater 
for the for the broader organization and be more sustainable because it's about really changing behaviors and cultures. Absolutely right. Now I have to ask this question before the end of the show, Karen, because as someone who is passionate about the world of coaching, I consider myself a coach. It's very rare I get someone who I would consider to be in the super coach category on my show, right? And that is definitely yourself. So I'm going to ask you to tell the listeners who may or may not be familiar with your work, if you can just bring your recent book to life, because you've written a book, Leading with Character, 10 Minutes a Day to a Brilliant Legacy. Um, I, you know, I will put a link to the show notes, tell people more about that. But if people want to find out more about the, the messages within the book and a little bit more about yourself, where can they go and, and tell us a little bit about what inspired the uh, the, the work? Um, sure. Leading with Character was a book that I worked on with Jim Lear and is really based on his work <clears throat> in the character space for many years. As I mentioned, he worked with some of the top athletes in the world, top CEOs. And as we saw over time, the statistics around um, ethical relapses um, or ethical lapses, I should say, with with leaders and and moral and ethical decisions and behavior being the number one reason for leaders to fail and the impact on not just companies, it's communities, individuals, families. Um, the timing, I think, was right for that. And I think people didn't un- recognize that character is something that can be trained. It's a muscle, just like any of the other muscles we talked about, empathy, um, emotional, mental. It's it's a it's a muscle that can be trained, and we don't think about it. We just label people as someone of strong character or weak character and Then someone does something, we say that's so not like them. But at the end of the day, we can all do something that we might not be proud of or think that's like us, like us, because we we have vulnerability and because we you know have an area that that hasn't been addressed. So the idea is going back to that legacy piece and the impact you want to have, going to the very end of your life and saying, How do I want to be remembered? What kind of person do I want to be to my to my children, to my colleagues, to my teams, to my friends? And then, and then how do you build towards that? So the first thing is finding out where do I have vulnerabilities? Where might I be a little bit weak? Um, I know for me, one of my challenges was customer service, people who seem to not be willing to help or um, difficult, but where might I be impatient in my life? And is that how I want to be experienced? Is that how I want to treat other people? So first we start with understanding kind of vulnerability in ourselves um, that we need to address so that we can be that person that we want so that we can have that impact. So any of this is all about intentionality, reflection, journaling. This is a guided journal. It, it's a book and a journal. And the journal asks you questions every day to get you to think about it, to get you to understand where you want to change, and then to get you to practice to address those so you can become a better person and, and have a better life. And um, it goes back to all the things that we just talked about in terms of getting to the top or getting to a place where yeah. you think you want to get in your life, whether it's a position or money or living in a certain community, whatever it is. And then finding out that, you know, that didn't make me happy. And I just spent a whole lot of time and resources and wasted things that might've been important to get something because I didn't understand why or how. So it's, it's a mechanism, I think, for helping people think about it now so that they can continue to build. We're never there, right? We're never there until the end of our lives. And at the end of their lives, you just end up somewhere. And and this is to ideally help people to get to a place where they're proud of and happy to be and less regrets. Fantastic. And I hopefully that's something that everyone can take away. Whatever journey they're on, that they haven't got meaning behind that, they haven't got their purpose. When they get to that destination, they're going to be disappointed. So uh, maybe that's the tool they need to help find that meaning. So I recommend that. There will be a link in the show notes. But if I'm a, if I'm a CNO, CEO or I'm an HR director, CHRO, listening to this show at the minute, and I want to find out more about Evolve Leadership and, and maybe get in touch with, uh, with yourself, Cam, where, where would I direct them? Sure. Um, certainly can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, it's Karen with a C, C-A-R-E-N-K-E-N-N-E-Y, um, or reach out to me through Evolve Leadership. It's evolveleadership.com. Fantastic. And I will make sure for everyone listening to the show, if you are listening on Apple device or, or iOS, uh, this will be in the show notes. So click straight through. You can find uh, the evolveleadership.com web address. I'll put a Karen uh, Kenny's uh, LinkedIn profile in there as well. And there's also a really good blog, which I recommend anyone listening to this. If you've enjoyed today's content, there's a blog on the Evolve Leadership website, uh, which is uh, forward slash our insights, our hyphen insights, which gives uh, some really, really interesting content as well, which explores some of these subjects in more detail. So 
definitely recommend you have a look at that. And there will also be a link to Karen's book. Of course, if you are an HRLD professional listening to the show, you need support with an HR related vacancy, then do get in touch with myself uh, or any of my team at JJ Recruitment. There'll be a link in the no- uh, show notes for that as well, which is jgarecruitment.com. It always just leaves me to say a huge thank you to Karen Kenny for joining me today. It's been a fantastic exploration into the world of executive coaching. Um, this is someone who I'll tell you all listeners is an absolute top of their game super coach in this field so please please do check out the site please do check out the book um it will really help you find purpose find meaning support your own mental health support your career aspirational journeys there's so much you can take from visiting that website from looking at the book and finding out more so please please take my advice go and do that and uh leaves me a huge huge thank you to karen for joining me today on the hrnd podcast karen thank you thank you nick so great to be here with you and um thank you for sharing your energy and your purpose Really appreciate it. Pleasure is all mine. That's it for today's episode of the HR L&D podcast. I hope you found this discussion informative and thought provoking and that it gave you actionable insights to help you drive your HR agenda forward. Please remember to subscribe to the show so you never miss a future episode. And I'd also love to hear from you. So if you enjoyed this show, please do leave a review on your preferred podcast platform. Your feedback helps me to ensure I can continue to bring you the topics and guests that matter most to you. Oh, and don't forget to share this show with your colleagues and fellow HR leaders as well. The more we spread the word, the more we can grow our community of HR professionals who I know are all as dedicated to driving the future of work forward as I am. Thanks, of course, for tuning in. My name is Nick Gay. Please do look me up on LinkedIn and send me a connection request. It would be great to get connected. In the meantime, I look forward to bringing you the next episode of the HR L&D podcast real soon.